Hi everyone, my name is Donna and welcome to What's the Stitch, a weekly web series where I answer all of your burning questions about sewing, costuming, and cosplay. Today I want to talk about historical die craft. What colors did they have? What did they use to make them? And what could you tell about a person from the clothes that they wore? Now it might surprise you to find that there was actually quite a bit of variation when it came to dye colors historically. After all, look at all the royal portraits throughout history, all of the beautiful paintings that are done on the walls in the palaces and tombs. These colors weren't exaggerated. Those bright pinks and greens and reds and blues were all colors that could be made naturally and were not in fact made synthetically until the late 1800s. The first recorded mention of fabric dyeing was done in China in approximately 2600 BCE. The dyes were of course made from plant fibers and natural pigments mixed with water and oils and the same techniques were actually used to create the colors in prehistoric cave paintings. These colors do vary by geographical region because, of course, you're going to have different plants and animals available in different areas throughout the world. And we do actually still have some ancient examples of extant textiles. The oldest remaining examples that we have date back to the Neolithic era and were discovered in southern Anatolia. The samples that were found were in shades of red, orange, and brown, and were some of the most popular colors throughout history. Studies show that multicolored fabrics were developed in Egypt somewhere between 200 and 300 BCE. These were done with weaving a red-brown warp thread with an ochre yellow weft, kind of like how they produce iridescent taffeta today. These patterns and designs could also be created using wax resist techniques during the dyeing process. Basically how this works is that you take a small pot of melted wax and using a stylus or a small funnel, trace your design on your fabric and let that dry before you set the fabric in the dye bath. I've done this myself in a project before for one of my university classes and it was a tremendous amount of fun and one of my classmates had an absolutely stunning project between wax and color resists he managed to build up the layers so his final project looked like an oil painting we were all absolutely amazed with what he came up with it was completely amazing you can see here in this example how this wax resist technique might have been used note the shapement of the figures on the fabric and also the red and black borders that are traced around the outside Many of the most common plant-based dyes came from woad, indigo, saffron, and madder, which created shades of blue, yellow, and red, respectively. Animal dyes, such as the cochineal beetle, the lac insect, the murex snail, and the cuttlefish, made red, red violet, purple, and sepia brown. The colors that they produced became so popular that these animals and plants started to be raised commercially and became vital trade goods in Asia and Europe and some of these became so popular that their sources were actually hunted to extinction. The most famous of these, of course, is the Murex mollusk. This makes purpura, or what we would know as Tyrian purple. This term may be familiar to some of you, especially if you happen to be scholars of ancient history. This is the color that was most associated with royalty in the ancient world. It is estimated that it took over 8,500 mollusks to create a single gram of fabric dye. And during the days of the Roman Empire, Tyrian purple silk was literally worth its weight in gold. This is the reason why purple has long been associated with wealth and with royalty. It's because they are the only ones who could afford to wear it. This is a fragment of the shroud in which Emperor Charlemagne was buried in 814 CE. It was made of gold and Tyrian purple produced in Constantinople, what we today would know as the city of Istanbul. You can just imagine what this would have looked like when it was freshly woven and just exactly how much this piece was worth. And of course, just like today, fashion is subject to imitation and interpretation. By 300 CE, fabric dyers had discovered mixtures of red and blue dyes to create new shades of purple that would be more affordable to the average person. Of course, the nobility were not a fan of this at all. God forbid poor people wear their special color. Oh, the shame of it all. Let me clutch my pearls! So, of course, they had to do something about that. In the late 14th century, Emperor Theodosium of Byzantium issued a law that banned anyone but the imperial family from wearing purple under penalty of death. I know, ridiculous, right? It's like Julia Roberts wears a black gown to the Oscars and you show up in a black sundress the next day and you are hauled off and executed for wearing knockoff black. Completely insane. 
Some sumptuary laws in the past were actually reasonable. They were intended to keep families from bankrupting themselves by trying to stay fashionable. And of course, some of them were unfortunately done with the design of being able to notice exactly what social strata and caste someone belonged in by the style of their clothing. Towards the Middle Ages, a red dye produced with the eggs of the Kermis beetle became very popular and actually replaced Tyrian purple as their status symbol, possibly because they could not actually get any more Tyrian purple because they killed their golden goose, or golden mollusk, as the case might be. Now, Kermis red was not produced using the entire insect, but with the insect eggs, which looked like fine grains of sand or wheat grain. This is where the phrase dyed in the grain came from. It became really popular in the 15th century, and samples of Kermis dye have been found dating back to the Neolithic era. One could use Kermis red to create a bunch of different shades with a process known as weft dyeing. You can make shades of black, gray, and brown by dyeing the wool blue with woad before the thread was spun, and then piece dyeing the cloth after it was woven. By the end of the 14th century, pure Kermis red fabric was considered the most regal, luxurious color in the European market, and that's why it's still seen quite commonly in heraldry and coronations today. The Spanish conquest of the Aztecs in the New World introduced the European markets to a new shade of red. This was done using the Mexican cochineal beetle, what we would see as a relative of the ladybug. This produced a stronger red dye using smaller volumes than the Kermis beetle did. This red became so popular that it became the standard color of fox hunters coats as well as the red coats of the British army. This was even a shade favored by Louis XV of France and his mistress Renette de Poisson, who we now know as Madame du Pompadour. It was used very commonly in clothing and decor and even in lacquers to decorate furniture. Here are some samples of some cochineal dyed silks. As you can see, it varies from this lovely sort of wine purple color to a very pretty rose pink. Of course, this wasn't the only way to create red because not everyone had access to a bunch of little ladybugs in order to dye their fabric. In China, red dye was created by heating white lead pigment to make lead tetraoxide. They also used matter to color silk or make red lacquers for furniture. In India, they used a plant that is known as rubia course, just like the ruby red gem. Lincoln green, which is what we would recognize as sort of like a Robin Hood forest green, was made by over dyeing woad colored blue wool with well or green weed. And this was used until the 18th century when it was replaced by a brighter Saxon green, which was produced by mixing indigo and fustic. Yellow dyes were the easiest to produce naturally because so many different plants resulted in this color for dye. This includes saffron, pomegranate rind, turmeric, onion skin, and even certain colors of lichens can be used to produce different shades of yellow. This made this color very common to be worn amongst all classes. These natural dyes were in continuous use until the early 1800s, when a man named William Perkins was conducting experiments to look for an alternative cure for malaria. This was not what he found. What instead he discovered was that the mixture of coal tar that he was using had turned from black to purple a color that he called Mauvine, what we know as Mauve. As you can see, it is this absolutely stunning shade of bright violet, and you can see immediately why the London dye houses were battling themselves to get a hold of this formula. So with this success, Perkins left the Royal College of Chemistry and started making synthetic dyes. The crazy part about all this is he was only 15 years old, and this was far from the only synthetic dye discovery that he made. His other discoveries include Britannia Violet and Perkins Green, and his company also produced red dye from the matter root. This was the beginnings of the synthetic dye industry. Later on, we got shades like Fuchsine, which was developed in 1858, Saffronine, which followed, and then in 1896, we got a color called Indiline. The new shades of green in particular were a very big deal, because until the 1860s, synthetic green dye could only be made with arsenic. You ever wonder where the phrase poison green came from? This is where. And yes, it was incredibly toxic and it was in everything. Textiles, wallpaper, entire homes would be covered in this stuff. And of course it was incredibly dangerous to anyone who lived inside. So of course it was a blessing when aniline greens replaced arsenic. This led to later developments of other bright shades such as electric yellow and electric blue. Of course, 
not everyone was a fan of these bright aniline colors. At the turn of the 20th century, the Shah of Persia banned the use of aniline dyes in carpet manufacturing and declared that producers of aniline dyed rugs were to be heavily fined and that their stocks would be seized and publicly burned. Shortly after this, Adolf von Bayer, yes, the aspirin guy, figured out the molecular structure of indigo and started working on chemical processes to create synthetic indigo dyes. Today, dye colors are far more than a status symbol or a mark of individuality. They are a very powerful marketing tool. Modern fashion designers make a point of declaring colors demode one season and unfashionable the next. This drives consumption of products seasonally instead of relying on single pieces for several years as was done in the past. And colors are often associated with the brands themselves as a very powerful point of their branding. For example, Tiffany Blue, Chanel and the Little Black Dress, the Hudson's Bay Company and their primary colored stripes. The Pantone Company declares a color of the year every December and they work with international brands to incorporate the psychology and emotion of color into their annual design strategies. Personally, I'm waiting for the year when we finally, finally get TARDIS blue as the color of the year because I swear I will buy everything in that color. Aside from being just a massive Doctor Who fan, I just really love that shade of blue. Thank you for joining me at this brief history of textile dyeing. If you enjoyed it, hit that like button. And if there's any clothing item that you would like the history of or something neat that you want to learn how to make, leave me a comment below and I will address that in a future video. And if you want to be notified when I post something new, ring that bell. Alright everyone, thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you all next week. Bye!